The topic is Google Azure Data Center. What does that mean? Um, whose data center looks like this? Looks fairly familiar? So this is a traditional data center that's been in vogue for the last two decades. Um, you have your various tiers of storage. When I say your traditional data center, you've you got your store, uh, storage, your servers, and then your sand fabric connecting those, those tiers in between. So a three-tier architecture. Uh, this is also a hardware-defined data center. Hardware-defined means that I can walk down this aisle here and I can pick out the pieces of hardware and I know what's running on, I know which apps is, are running on that hardware because the hardware is defining what the purpose is, right? Hardware-defined data center. Um, this is what's losing today. This technology and this architecture is losing today to the cloud, right? This is why, if you have this architecture, this is why your CIO and your business units are going to the cloud. So what are the cloud guys doing? All right, this is a picture of a web scale data center. I'm not sure whose this is, but it could be Google, Amazon, Facebook. Let's define web scale. First, let's take a step back. Let's define hyper-converged. Anybody familiar with hyper, the term hyper-converged? Scott, good, good. Hyper-converged is a, is a simple term for you take your, those three traditional, uh, traditional tiers of, of infrastructure, storage, networking, and compute, and combine them into one box, right? And web scale is a flavor of hyper-converged that uh, was pioneered at companies like Google and Facebook and Amazon that you see here. So some, some tenants of web scale, um, as you can see, or what don't you see in this picture? I don't see any brand names here at all, right? I don't see any big refrigerator-sized boxes full of disk drives. Um, and that's because one of the tenants of a web scale data center is everything is based off of x86 servers, one pizza box after another. Um, the only thing a web scale data center requires is a fast Intel chipset, a lot of RAM, some internal disk drives. And then you can see there's 10 gigabit ethernet sticking out the back. There's no special purpose appliance in, our hard, in, this, in this type of hardware. So that means that all the intelligence in a web scale data center is in the software and the definition of a, a software-defined data center, as opposed to the previous slide, is I can walk up and down this aisle, and I can po point to any one of those pizza boxes. I have no idea what's running on them, right? It's the software running on these boxes that's defining their purpose. That's, that's the definition of 100% software-defined. And then the third component, or the third tenant of a web-scale data center is scale-out. We can scale out one node at a time to meet any workload, and my performance and my capacity scale linearly as I add nodes to the cluster. So um, anybody see Amazon's earnings last month? It was significant because it was the first time that Amazon broke away their earnings for AWS from the rest of the Amazon mothership. And the analysts that covered AWS, Goldman Sachs at the time, they, they predicted that AWS would have about a billion and a half in top line revenue and be uh, zero profit or slightly underwater in profitability. And AWS came out with their earnings about a month ago. They were $4.4 billion in top line revenue and $660 million in profit. And they're on track this year to do $6 billion in revenue. So that's $6 billion that your CIO and your business units chose not to invest in your on-premise cloud and took it to Amazon's cloud. And there's a reason for that, right? Amazon wouldn't, AWS wouldn't be doing very good if all of our data centers in corporate IT were efficient, agile, and cost-effective as a web-scale data center. And so this is what Nutanix does. We bring web-scale concepts that are only found in these giant cloud service providers and, and bring it to corporate IT. All right, so how do we do this? I have a three-node cluster here. Three x86 boxes uh, with some internal flash and some internal hard drives uh, running a hypervisor. This looks 
scarily familiar to you know, infrastructure circa 1992. Right, it, except uh, you know where we take the disk drives out and they're back inside local to the, each server. But uh, what gives it away as a more modern architecture is a there's a hypervisor and b we've got high speed flash right internals of the box. So what Nutanix does is on your hypervisor you can see in blue there there's a there's a blue box on each one of these hosts called the CVM. That's the Nutanix controller virtual machine. We've taken that. SP controller out of your, hard, or your hardware SAN, virtualized it at, into a virtual machine, and we run ones of our storage controllers on each one of your hosts in your cluster. Uh, this, this controller virtual machine is nothing more than CentOS 6.5 running our, our software, our Nutanix software. We're 100% software defined. So th these CVMs do two things. Number one, they are the storage controller for those internal SSDs and HDDs. All I.O. to the internal local storage goes through the controller VM and bypasses the hypervisor completely. The hypervisor is not even aware that there are internal disk drives inside of it. Okay? The second thing that the controller VMs do is through those top erect, you saw the 10, in that web scale data center, you saw the 10 gigabit coming out the back. We do the same thing through top erect 10 gigabit switches <clears throat> The controller VMs talk to each other and form a cluster. And with, what the cluster looks like is they take all, the, rather than islands of internal uh, uh, disk drives, they pool all those disk drives together in the one big storage pool called the Nutanix distributed file system. Very suspiciously like the Hadoop distributed file system, right? Um, and it is very close. Uh, Scott just got done talking about big data. Basically what the NDFS is, is a Hadoop file system that we've kind of tailored. We actually use MapReduce and curator jobs in the background to solve big data-like problems, such as disk rebuilds or distribution of data across all the nodes in the network. And then on top of the Hadoop file system, we layer a Cassandra NoSQL database with our own proprietary algorithm to make it ACID consistent. Because strangely enough, in this storage world, people don't like eventual consistency with, your, with their tier one apps, right? Funny thing. So, that's our, kind of our secret sauce in a nutshell. And of course, this, um, <clears throat> like as you would expect, any enterprise solution, we support um, disk tiering, data tiering between the tor uh, SSDs and HDDs. We support snapshots, clones, compression, dedupe, replication. Everything is done at VM level of granularity. And just to build this slide out here, um, we also support Hyper-V, and we also support KVM. So, but let's just stick with uh, ESX for now. What in, in essence we're doing here is we're fooling your ESX cluster into thinking it's talking to shared NFS storage when in reality it's talking to internal disk drives. Okay. So the two obvious main benefits of this, of hyperconverged in general, is we get rid of your SAN and your SAN fabric. Okay. And then number two, by putting those disk drives internal again circa 1992, performance goes through the roof, right? The huge performance gains. When those VMs want to, you're running on host one there, they want to do a re IO, it goes memory to memory to SSD. It's tough to beat that for a low latency IO path. So um, just a couple of reasons of why Nutanix in particular, lower time to value for any CIOs out there. You order Nutanix, shipping time, 10, let's just say 10 business days. The morning it arrives, we'll be on site to install it. We'll go and we'll have a nice long lunch, and when we come back, you have a working production-ready ESX, Hyper-V, KVM cluster ready for, to deploy uh, your tier one workloads. Um, pay as you grow, right? Think of this as just-in-time inventory for the automobile industry that happened in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Think of Nutanix as just-in-time inventory for your IT infrastructure. You don't have to predict 18 months or three years from now, how much capacity and, and you, you'll need, and, and maybe those spinning disks you won't even use for 24 months, right? That's, that's a lot of depreci depreciation in your IT infrastructure that you're, you're it's just wasted, wasted money. With Nutanix, you can think about what you need next quarter, order it this quarter, and then next quarter, see how you're trending, and order the next batch of blocks for, to, to keep on growing for the next quarter. And again, we scale one node at a time and performance capacity scales linearly. And obviously reduced OPEX. If you eliminate two thirds of your IT infrastructure, 
your costs and your management and complexity are going to go way down. All right, so um, workloads. Before, before I get to the demo, um, we traditionally started off a few years ago with VDI, and we're still excellent at VDI. Um, we have reference architectures with Citrix and VMware, KVM. <clears throat> But we also have branched out into tier one apps. So if you think your Oracle or SAP infrastructure is too good for web scale, architecture is too important, I need to run it on that tier one, quote unquote, V block, um, please stop by the booth afterwards and I can tell you some customer use cases running SAP and Oracle on Nutanix. And on the lower uh, left there, we have hybrid clouds where we, you can replicate amongst Nutanix nodes or you can replicate from Nutanix nodes into AWS or Azure. And then we also have some uh, fantastic big data uh, reference architectures and use cases, as well as uh, unified communications with like Avaya or, or uh, Microsoft or Cisco. And I want to leave you with something too, two things. Uh, if there's any questions, please stop by the booth, or you can Google search the Nutanix Bible, and it'll tell you exactly how we do things um, to a, a degree of minutia that you know, you'll, you'll put you to sleep. I mean, it's, it's very detailed. Uh, the other thing is Ahead's a fantastic Nutanix partner, and they have Nutanix gear in their lab, and they're happy to demo it for you and do a, like a little mini EBC on site there. All right, so let me break out of this PowerPoint. I think I got a few minutes left. I'm actually doing pretty good on time for once. All right, so what I'm going to log into here um, is, is our, our, our management element, which is called Prism. So while I'm logging in, you know, we'll stick with ESX as an example. Managing a, a clus, uh, an ESX cluster running on Nutanix is very similar to managing an ESX cluster running on anything else. Um, you do it through vCenter or the web client, whatever you, you're comfortable with. But this Prism GUI is, is an additional component that allows you to see what's going on with the Nutanix nodes themselves. It's not like you're going to spend a lot of time with this. As you can tell, we do Active Directory authentication. So I have Prism Central here. Let me make this a little clearer for you guys. So Prism Central is a roll-up or a bird's eye view of all the Prism elements managers running on each individual Nutanix cluster. It's all HTML5 based. If I want to go directly to a Nutanix cluster, I can HTTP to any one of those controller VMs and get Prism. And what I did here was I went to Prism Central, again, which is a way to manage multiple Nutanix clusters at various sites. So what I have, Prism Central, it's telling me here I've got five different clusters, and they are running different versions of Nutanix OS here. Can you guys see that okay? It's a little small. Um, 786 VMs across all five of these clusters. And you can see down here at the bottom, I have three clusters running ESX, I have one cluster running KVM, and one cluster running Hyper-V. For, for troubleshooting and, and to get, out of, get you out of the finger pointing business, if I wanna see, uh, for example, which of my uh, hosts, my 24 hypervisors are the, the busiest, I can quickly drill down, I can go to the hardware page here, and I can get a list of all my hypervisors running across all five of these clusters and I can quickly sort and say, oh, okay, let's see who's, who's, doing the, who's using the most uh, uh, CPU uh, utilization here. So I can sort on the CPU usage, and I can quickly see, okay, uh, there's this one POC03A hypervisor that's running in the POC3 cluster, and he's using 73% of his CPU. I can click on that, and I can get a graph down here instantly, and I can go back in time and see how long this has been going on, and quickly drill down into problems and, and, and solve those problems without, without calling the storage guy or calling the SAN switch guy and seeing if there's any issues. And if I wanna go back to the home screen here, this is again Prism Central, to actually go and then do some actionable items on some of these clusters. I can give you a quick tour here by clicking on the left. Here's a list of all five of my uh, clusters. If I start off at the bottom, here's a Nutanix cluster running Hyper-V. Um, rather than shared NFS storage, to, to Hyper-V we look like SMB3 shares, okay? So it's the same concepts apply. But um, I also have an, another Nutanix cluster here running um, KVM. 
And this is our flavor of KVM. I don't know if anybody saw the, the buzz last week, the announcements. Uh, we came out with the Extreme Computing Platform, formerly known as Acropolis. It's our flavor of KVM with, um, and what, KVM is a nice hypervisor, the traditional knock against KVM. There's no management tool, so you only find it at these science experiment labs or government labs where these guys write all these scripts to manage KVM. Well, with Nutanix and our, our extreme computing platform, we're trying to bridge that gap and bring some vCenter-like functionality to KVM. So if I click on this VM tab here, I can get a table of all my VMs running on this KVM cluster. And if I click on some of these, you see there's buttons up here. I can create a new VM. I can create a distributed vSwitch. And then I can access the console on this VM. I can power it on, power it off. I can clone it, take a snapshot of it. So we're, we're, you know, we're obviously not to the level of vCenter, but we're trying to bring some nicer management functionality to KVM. And then finally here, if I, I have three other clusters running ESX. <clears throat> Two of these, Metro A and Metro B, um, are, in, are doing a, they're a metro cluster, so there's synchronous replication between them. Um, uh, POC03 is, is usually a, a kind of a disaster. This is where everybody logs in in the company to do demos, so there's like tons of critical alerts and everything like that. So I, I'm not gonna use that. So I'm gonna log into like Metro B here. And so, it, you know, we eliminate the SAN and the SAN fabric, right? And, and, and bring some agility back to that Three, you know, that you, you lost with that three-tier architecture. And a good example of that here is, here's, here's a Prism. I'm zoomed in on Metro B, which is an ESX cluster. It's got only 10 VMs running on it, four hosts and one block. If I want to see what these um, locks kind of look like, if I go to the hardware tab and look at a diagram, you can see I have a 2U Nutanix block here, and there are four ESX hosts running inside of it. I can click on any one of these and get performance data and performance graphs. <clears throat> Same thing with VMs. I go to the dashboard of the VM tab, I get an overview, top, top VMs uh, by IOPS, top VMs by IO latency. I can quickly drill down and to see what's, who's doing what. And finally, if I get that call, hey, I need to present some more storage, provision some more storage to my, to my ESX cluster. Again, we look like NFS storage. So if I go to the storage tab, and I always like the table view, here's the storage pool. There's only one storage pool usually on most Nutanix clusters. This is the, this is the, ND, the Nutanix distributed file system here. This is hidden from your hypervisor. It's not aware that, it's basically fancy Hadoop under the covers. All, the, all 24 disk drives in these Nutanix cluster are in the one storage pool. And then we carve up the storage pool into NFS data storage, which we call containers, and provision that to your ESX cluster. So what I can do here is just quickly provision a new container. We'll call it Blackhawks uh, in honor of the, the celebration going on outside right now. And I can get into, uh, I can mount, it'll automatically mount it up on all ESX hosts in the cluster. And if I click on advanced settings, I can set the redundancy factor. I can, I can thick provision it by default. It's thin provision. And then I can turn on dedupe or compression or leave them off or do whatever I want so I can meet different SLAs. So I'm going to provision this new Blackhawks uh, container. So that took a few seconds here. And if I go to vCenter, um, and if I go to, uh, hopefully it's still active, if I go to data stores and clusters, here is my Blackhawks uh, data, data store ready to go, ready to deploy VMs in under 10 seconds. I didn't have to call a storage guy. I didn't have to provision any LUNs. I didn't have to export any NFS data stores. I didn't have to do any of that, right? I just instantly provisioned this data store.